Well, there's never been a better time to become aware of this history because as I'm sure we're all aware, there's quite a bit of tension uh, politically going on in our society right now. And not all of it, but some of it um, arises from issues of race and our racial history. And so to be able to give to each their due in the sense that America is a special place with a dream that has attracted immigrants from all over the world and has inspired revolutions in other parts of the world and whose claims about the equality of all people uh, were radical at the time um, and are still radical today. Uh, that's all true. And at the very same time, we did not live up to that standard. We didn't live up to our own constitution in our treatment of black Americans. And that history is very painful. It's distorted our relationships. It's distorted our economy. It's even distorted our theology, I think, in some cases. And so it's incredibly important to be able to talk about both, uh, particularly now that there's such a tension and a polarization going on in our society. The idea is that there's a, a classical liberal tradition in political philosophy. This is the tradition of our founders. They had some other ideas in there too, but that was a central part of their approach. And it has to do with individual freedom, the role of the government as very important in protecting those freedoms, but sort of minimal elsewhere. <laughs> and uh, what are those freedoms? The, the freedom to not only control myself, but also to own property, to uh, contract out my labor, to make deals with you and agreements, and be able to move where I need to move, and also to enjoy the protection of the rule of law. And so the idea of the book is that classical liberalism isn't necessarily the tradition people think of when they think of black history, but they should. And so I try to go back and show how much of a role classical liberals had in the abolitionist movement in the formation of the NAACP, uh, in various civil right, parts of the civil rights movement, and, and today when it comes to issues that are important to black Americans like the mass incarceration crisis, for instance, um, classical liberalism has a lot to say to those issues. And so I'm thinking about two areas, black history and classical liberalism, that seem like they don't go together, but I actually think they really do go together. And then as I go through the book and I cover the history of the way that black people have been excluded economically by having their rights to property and freedom of contract abrogated and, and their enjoyment of the rule of law abrogated, I also move on to talk about solutions that are based in markets, civil society, and policies that are more about getting out of people's way than they are about socially engineering people, which is sort of where we went wrong. that the term liberalism in America currently is often used to refer to people who are left-leaning. But this is actually not the way the term liberalism is used either in philosophy or frankly anywhere else in the world. Um, liberalism comes from the word liber, which means freedom or free, like liber liberty. And it has to do with being a form of government whose goal is to protect the individual rights of the citizens. So it can sort of be compared to, say, like an ancient political philosophy where you live in a small homogeneous society and the goal is for everyone to be good. Well, I want everyone to be good too, but in a pluralistic society that's 330 million people, we may not totally agree on what that looks like, right? Classical liberals tend to be pretty enthusiastic about the free market because that's what individuals do when they're free, right? They start to, their, their creativity starts to bubble up. And so now I wanna make things and build something and solve a problem and make a deal with you and do what I'm doing more efficiently because we're doing it together, right? All of these problem solving sort of things that in, in places where the political system is either very corrupt um, or it's just sort of a low trust society in general um, you can't really trust the courts. If I make a deal with you, you could just go bribe the judge. In places like that, you don't see a flourishing market because people can't trust one another. But if I can trust you, then we can make deals and we can make things happen. And the free market has been incredibly liberatory all over the world. So we now have 
0.7 billion people living in abject poverty, but we have seven and a half billion people on the planet. This is actually the lowest number of people living in abject poverty ever in the history of humanity. It's incredible. What I say to students is to be extremely intentional about the way that you curate your news and social media intake. What that means is you're gonna to wanna to have voices from both the left and the right. Just even if you're on one side or the other, you need to sort of keep up with what the other side is saying. You shouldn't be clueless about what the other side is saying. And of course, I'm a classical liberal, so I think of those news organizations as being sort of neither left nor right. Um, but there's wonderful organizations like Cato and Reason Magazine and others that you can follow that are, that are a kind of a third voice, a different voice from the other two. So that can be very helpful. And then you have to, um, you know, just be incredibly thoughtful about the way that you're weighing things when you have the temptation to indulge in a knee-jerk reaction. Because we need to be aware constantly that the people who are sending us the news are trying to make us mad so that we will click, <laughs> right? It's a manipulative system and they're trying to rile us up. And so we have to be sort of um, stoic, right? With regard to what we're reading and keep in mind that, um, you know, the, they, they are shaping the narrative in such a way as to create a certain reaction. And so if I can sort of come at the news with that kind of intentional, self-controlled perspective, hopefully I can come out with some kind of a balance. And one thing that I personally do is sort of ask myself, you know, what would someone who doesn't have my perspective say if they read this, right? So that I can check myself to some extent um, and check my, my biases. In Black Liberation Through the Marketplace, I ended up writing an entire chapter on the black church. And I learned so much in researching and writing that chapter. And I became, as a Christian who truly believes that the church is the hope of the world, you know, Jesus is the hope of the world through his church and the work of his church, I became increasingly convinced that uh, reconciliation between the white church and the black church will be key to healing in the United States. And that is a very, very tall order. I'm just not going to beat around the bush. I'm going to say that uh, we are fairly alienated from one another right now. Um, some of that is just historical momentum. We're two separate communities that, that developed separately. And some of it is real pain and hurt from our history. And so I wish that Christians in particular could be countercultural in this way. So not reactionary, but countercultural and kind of be willing to bust out of their tribes in important ways in order to achieve that reconciliation, because I think it would change everything, frankly. I think that American religious life is very fundamental to American culture. And so the reconciliation of these two groups would be extremely powerful, but it would take almost an anti-tribalist movement, right? A kind of movement within the church that's saying, I am not going to, um, you know, sign up for a life where um, I just line up completely on one side of the culture wars, uh, but rather I'm going to go one topic at a time and think it through in a very careful way. And that takes a lot of work. And so uh, could, could the Lord do it? Yes, he can. So uh, I maintain hope.